Hi everyone, uh, in this video I want to talk about hypothesis testing and I'm going to be using this worksheet from class as sort of a backdrop. Uh, I'm going to go through it. Um, it. This is a worksheet about the proportion, um, but I'm going to talk about the mean as well and the t-distribution. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to have this worksheet up on class, but this is sort of the uh, what, what's taking me through the, the video step by step. Okay, so I'm going to get rid of this. Now, what I want to do here is quickly, I'm going to try to do this in 15 minutes or less. Uh, a lot of my videos are a little on the long side, uh, but I want to go through the process start to finish of a hypothesis test. Now, every hypothesis test starts with a claim and it ends up with some final conclusion, right? So the, in essence, the test is there's some claim or some statement that's being made and you have to determine using statistics whether or not the data backs up the claim. It's a yes, it's basically a yes, no question. And so what I want to do here is go through the step-by-step -step process. Now you see there's a list of 10 things here uh, on my worksheet. I have it broken out in eight, so there's a couple that are combined, but uh, it's they're going to be the same, same information. It's very important that at each step you're doing things correctly, right? So you start with the claim. And I'll go through each of these starting with step one, step-by-step -step in a moment, but you start with the claim that claim tells you the null hypothesis. Now you don't have a choice. That claim tells you the alternate hypothesis. You don't have a choice, right? And then the alternate hypothesis tells you the direction of the test. You don't have a choice here. Right? Everything is coming from the claim. So I can't over or overemphasize the importance of starting off correctly, right? Once you have the direction of the test and the significance, which is given in the problem, those tell you the critical value, right? And the test statistic, that's coming from, you know, that's coming from over here. The test statistic, that is our sample data, right? So step one, two, three, four, five, and six are coming from the claim. Then in the problem, you'll be given some sample data. Now that sample data may have to be, uh, may, it may have to do with the proportion. It may have to do with the mean. Uh, we could deal with either. Um, once you have the test statistic, that gives you the p-value. Once you have the test statistic, the p-value and the critical value, these three, six, seven, and eight, that tells you what to do with the null hypothesis. And once you know what to do with the null hypothesis, step one and step nine, when you combine them, they give you step 10. So there's a lot of, you know, it's previous steps dictating what has to come next, right? So it's not, it, there's not a, a lot of you having to make choices. It's more you having to follow a logical progression from start to finish. It's like dominoes, right? Stack up a, a bunch of dominoes, not the game dominoes, but you, you stack up some dominoes, you, you knock over the first one and it knocks all the rest down in, in order. It's like that, it's like 10 dominoes, you know, stacked up like this and you got 10 dominoes and you know, you tap this one and then they all fall down and you know, something cool happens. All right, so again, the claim, right? If you if you start off wrong, the whole problem is going to be flawed and you're going to get the wrong answer. So the claim. Now, the claim is given in the problem in English, right? In, in this in this class, in my class, the problem is in, in the language of English. And the first thing you have to do is convert it to a different or tra translate is a better word. Translate from English to mathematical symbols. Now you have six possible mathematical symbols. Now I'm using P for proportion here, uh, but it's the same, this whole video, same steps for the mean. Um, I'm just using proportion as the example. So you've got an equal sign. You've got a not equal to sign. You've got the greater than and less than. Right? You got the greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. So you've got six possible options for the claim. Now, which one to pick? This is this is the key right here. The whole hypothesis test comes down to this, right? You got six options. You got to pick the right one. If you pick the wrong one, no matter what you do for the next seven steps, you're going to be wrong at the end, right? So it's important to pick the right one. And I have six examples right here, All right? One, two, three, four, five and six. Now I'm going a little fast. I'm talking a little fast. So, you know, feel free to pause and rewind and, you know, and go back or just take a break. So here's, you know, this is the beginning of the question. There's a, it's a dot, dot, dot. So 
A local coffee shop makes a statement about the use of reusable coffee mugs by customers at their shop. Use a 0.02 level of significance to test the claim that, and then the dot, dot, dot here is followed by one of these six statements. All right, so first thing we see is this level of significance, right? We'll get to that later, but level of significance, the symbol we're using for that is alpha. So alpha equals 0 0.02. And what is alpha? Alpha is an area. It's an area, part of the normal distribution or the T distribution, if we're using that one, it's an area under the graph, right? So we'll use alpha later uh, for our critical value. But let's start off with statistical statement, right? A, uh, use a 0 0.02 level of significance to test the claim that six out of 10 customers bring their own coffee mug. Now, that's an exact number, six out of 10. So six out of 10, we could say six, let's say six successes out of 10 trials. That's the fraction six over 10 or 0. Point, oops, not zero, 0. 0.6, right? Six out of 10, six over 10, 0. 0.6, right? So six out of 10 customers bring their own mug I'll write the claim next to each sentence. So the claim would be the population proportion equals 0 0.6. Right? That is the claim in mathematical symbols. 6 out of 10, not more than 6, not less than 6, not at least 6. It's exactly 6. It doesn't say the word exactly, but it's exactly 6 out of 10 or 0.6. Right? So check. The next one, the customers that bring their own mugs versus the ones that don't are not 50-50, right? So the customers that bring their own mugs, it's not 50%, not 50-50, not 50%. So we would say P is not equal to 0 0.5. That would be the claim for the second example let me just let me number these so this is example one this is example two okay uh, example three test the claim that more than three quarters of customers bring their own coffee mug so keyword here is more than more than so the proportion is more than greater than Three quarters, three quarters or three over four or 0 0.75. I'm trying to mix it up so you see it done multiple, you know, different ways the problem could shake out. Like in, the, in problem number one, you're given successes and trials, six and 10. You have to divide them, make it a decimal. Uh, number two, 50, 50. Number three, the words three quarters. So it's not always given... The, the proportion is not always given in exactly the same format, right? Number four, test the claim that. Remember, every one of these problems is coming from, you know, this one up here, right? Test the claim that at least three out of every five, right? At least three out of five. Well, three over five is 0 0.6. So at least 0.6. At least means greater than or equal to. At least means greater than or equal to. Uh, number five, test the claim that less than half of customers bring their own coffee mug. Well, half is 50% or 0.5, right? Proportion, we're always giving it as a decimal between zero and one. A uh, percentage is between one and 100, a proportion is between zero and one. So half or 50%, we would write 0.5. So less than half. 
So the population proportion is less than 0 0.5. Okay. And then number six, uh, no more than 20%. So in number six, the proportion is given as a percentage. No more than 20%. That means 20% or less. It just can't be greater than. So not more than, not greater than. If it's not greater than, it's got to be less than or equal. So population proportion, less than or equal to 0 0.2. Right? This is the most important step because once you establish the claim, we did, just did six of them in those six boxes on the right. Once you establish the claim, the rest of the problem is already determined. It's already decided. Now, once you have the claim, you move on to the hypotheses. Now, again, this, this video is not meant to, to explain every aspect of a hypothesis test. I'm just focusing on the pragmatic side of things, the step-by-step -step approach. Hopefully, you've either sat through class and listened to me explain uh, hypothesis testing more formally, or you've watched my video lecture where I go through my PowerPoint slides. In this video, I'm focused more on just doing the problems, doing the homework. So here's my guide, and this is what I pass out in class. Uh, this is my guide for choosing the alternate hypothesis um, now, I'm using 0 0.23 as just an example um, in this problem. But each one of these rows is one scenario. So if the original claim uses an equal sign, the null hypothesis uses an equal sign, and the alternate hypothesis uses a not equal to sign. Right? So each one of these lines is a separate scenario. Right? So let's see if I, I match them up with the top equal and then not equal so number one so i'm looking only at I'm, I'm not looking over here yet i'm just looking at the claim right the claim for the first problem was an equal sign so that tells me the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis would be equal and not equal to respectively All right so you're basically just following this chart sometimes the claim is the same as the alternate hypothesis and sometimes it's not. So when we come up here, back to these six problems, this is claim. And then next is the null hypothesis. Well, in every case, the null hypothesis, no matter what the claim is, the null hypothesis uses an equal sign. Don't even have to think about it. And the alternate hypothesis, that's the one that's gonna vary, right? If the original claim uses an equal sign, the null hypothesis uses a, or sorry, the alternate hypothesis uses a not equal to sign, right? So it's like a flow chart with these arrows, starting with the claim, then we got the null, then we got the alternate hypothesis. Right? If the original claim uses uh, number two, uses not equal to, the null hypothesis would be an equal sign. The alternate would be the same as the claim. P is not equal to zero point, oh, I said uh, point 0.5. That should be point 0.5 there, zero point 0.5. I'm just using different numbers in the different problems. What's important here is the symbol, the symbol, right? When the symbol for claim is equal, the symbol for alternate hypothesis is not equal and so on. Uh, when the original claim is a greater than symbol, the null hypothesis uses an equal sign and the alternate hypothesis then uses also greater than, same as the claim. I did it again using the numbers from the last problem 0 0.75 0 0.75 right when the original when the claim uses greater than or equal to the null hypothesis would be equal 0 0.6 and the alternate would be p is less than 0 0.6 
they can overlap. So an equal and a greater than or equal, they both have equal in them. So we can't use the greater than or equal to in the alternate hypothesis. So let me go back over here. For the alternate hypothesis, you, you only have three symbols here. Right? There's greater than, there's less than, and there's not equal to. Right? The null is always an equal sign. The alternate is one of these three. And the claim, well, that could be any of the six. All right, so all of these, these, these null, these alternate hypotheses, everything I'm doing here in these purple boxes with the hypotheses is coming from this chart. All right, so use this chart, use it. Uh, if the original claim is a less than symbol, null is again equal. And alternate would be same as the claim, less than. So you see less than again. Right. In my other video, I explain like the, the background, the, the explain what is the null hypothesis, what is the alternate hypothesis, how what do they represent, how do we use them. Here, I'm just focused on doing the test. And finally, if the claim uses less than or equal to, null hypothesis is equal, and alternate would be greater than. All right, so the claim dictates what is the null and alternate hypotheses. Now, we keep going, right? After you know the alternate hypothesis, that tells you what type of test it is, right? Is it a left-tailed test? Right, let me write it up here, left. Tailed. That means alpha, the significance. I said earlier, alpha is an area. Way over here somewhere. Yeah. Let me, let me switch to a different color. Uh, I said alpha is the significance. It's given in the problem, right? That is, that red shaded area is alpha. Given in the problem, always given in the problem. So for this example, that red shaded area would be 0 0.02 if it's a left tail test, All right? Then we got two tail tests. Let me go back to purple. Two tail tests, that means half of alpha is on the left and half of alpha is on the right, All right? So if the problem says alpha equals 0 0.02, then the area on the right would be 0 0.01 and the area on the left would be 0 0.01. And the inside, the green area here is always the, the, the rest, the complement, one minus alpha. So if significance is 2%, 0.02, then you would get 98, 0 0.98 in the middle. Okay, but right now we're just talking about the type of test, two-tailed, versus left-tailed, and then we also have a right-tailed test. Right? It, you don't get to decide, you don't get to pick which one you want to use. You have no power of decision-making here. You have to do what the claim tells you to do. Right? And it's coming from the alternate hypothesis. If, like a number one, if the claim is equal, then the null hypothesis is equal, then the alternate hypothesis is not equal. That tells you it's a two-tail test, right? So the sign, the symbol used in the alternate hypothesis tells you what type of test to use. Okay, so if the alternate, or if the, if the alternate hypothesis uses either Equal or not equal? It's a two-tailed test. Right? We're looking, uh, or, or no, it says it's never going to be not equal. It's never going to be equal. If the original, if the, uh, maybe let's write it like this. 
Uh, no, let's do let's do it like this. Two tail test. Okay. If the alternate hypothesis uses a not equal to symbol, then you have to use a two tail test. If the alternate hypothesis uses a greater than symbol, greater than means to the right, above. So if the alternate hypothesis uses greater than, then you have to use a right tailed test. Right? This left tail, right tail, two tail, it's just telling you where to put alpha. Right? Alpha, significance, it's given in the problem. It's an area. This is telling you where to put that area. So if it's a two-tail test, right, you split that area half on the left, half on the right. If it's a right-tail test, all the area is on the right. right. So two situations where we have a right-tail test. And then if the alternate hypothesis uses a less than symbol, it's a left tail test, right? It's coming from here. This is what tells you what to do up here, right? Alternate hypothesis tells you what your graph looks like, whether it's a left tail graph, a right tail graph, or a two-tail graph. Okay, so now that we have our graph, the next thing to do is to find the critical values. Uh, critical value should be somewhere around here. Where did I put critical value? Oh, yeah, we're still there. Sorry, shouldn't have moved at all. Determine the critical value, right? That's the... That's the number that separates alpha from the rest of the area, right? The number that separates alpha from the rest of the area. It's the same Excel function that we've been using for the last couple of chapters, right? The critical value, let me write this down because this is important, critical value is a z-score, right? That's observation number one. And observation number two, significance is an area. Now, critical value, it's a z-score because we're talking about proportion, but it also could be a t-value when we're talking about mean. It works the same way. All right, so you got a z-score and an area. The area is given in the problem. The area is given in the problem. You always will see the words. Use a you know blank level of significance, right? So you're given the area. Given area. Find z-score, right? That is our Excel function. Norm dot s dot i n v right norm dot s dot i n v and if it's if you're looking for a z score and if you're looking for a t it's t dot i n v right this is how you find critical values Given an area, find a z-score, or given an area, find a t-value. And so with the norm.s.inv, Excel needs area to the left. So sometimes you need to complement, sometimes you need to do one minus, you know, just, just if you draw out a nice graph and label each section of the graph, um, you should 
at this point, hopefully not have a problem with this because we've been using these functions so often in class. Um, and then if we're using the T distribution, same thing, parentheses, area to the left. Now, the only difference is with the T distribution, you need to tell Excel the degrees of freedom as well. Remember, degree of freedom is one less than the sample size, so N minus one. So these are the only two functions we have that we tell, that we know an area and we're looking for a value on the horizontal axis, whether it's a, a Z score or a T value. Okay, now that we have a critical value, then we move on to the test statistic. The test statistic is the sample data, right? So for proportion, you're going to take the sample data and turn it into a z-score. Always, 100% of the time, if you're dealing with proportion, that means it's a fraction or a uh, probability uh, or a proportion. If you're dealing with proportion, it's a z-score. If you're using the mean or a hypothesis test on the mean, sometimes it's a z-score, sometimes it's a t-value. Right? It depends right? whether you are given the population standard deviation or whether you are not given population standard deviation. So if you know sigma, if you know, remember sigma, sigma right here, sigma is the population standard deviation. If you're given that, you stick with the z-score. If you're using sample mean and sample standard deviation, it's a t. All right, so at this point, you have to choose the correct formula, right? You have three options, you know, a, b, and c. One of these is the, is the correct choice. The other two will give you the wrong answer. Uh, so calculate the test statistic. Um, We'll use Excel for this, or if you want to use a calculator, that's fine, but I like to use Excel because then there's no rounding involved because um, you're going to use your test statistic in the next step to calculate the p-value, right? So uh, this should be pretty straightforward. The sample data is given in the problem. Plug it into the formula, crank out a single number. So this is basically taking the sample data and converting it to a single number. Once you have the test statistic, then you could find the p-value, right? Can't do p-value first. So you, you need the test statistic to then find the p-value. Now p-value is an area, right? P-value is an area that comes from the test statistic. And you just gotta follow this flow chart because there's, there's four options down here for what the p-value will equal and they're all you know, you're going to use the same Excel function for all four. Don't matter. Uh, but it depends on question number one. Now we're going back to what kind of test is it? Left tail, right tail, or two tail? Remember, quick review. H1 uses less than. It's a left tail test. If H1 uses greater than, it's a right tail test. And if H1 alternate hypothesis, not an I, alternate hypothesis uses not equal to, it's a two tail test. Let me write it over here. H1 uses not equal to. All right, so you either go this way, this way, or down. And then uh, if it's a two tail test, is your test statistic to the right or left of center? That's just saying, is your test statistic positive? All right, this is step, this is what you just did in step five, test statistic, right? You plug some numbers in, you're gonna get a positive or a negative number, right? So if you get a positive, this is your p-value, right? If it's a right tail test, this is your p-value. If it's a two-tail test with a negative test statistic, this is your p-value. If it's a left-tail test, this is your p-value. Either way, p-value is an area. 
So to find the p-value, you have only two functions, two Excel functions. For z-score, you've got norm.s.dist. Right, that's for uh, for z scores. Norm dot s dot dic. So if it's a problem about proportion, this is what you do always. This is how you find the p value. If it's a hypothesis test on the mean, you may have a z score. You may have a t value. So for t values, it's equal t dot D I S T. All right, these are, there are no new Excel functions in this chapter. All right, we're just reusing uh, uh, for our class. For those of you who are not in this class, you don't know what I'm talking about, but for us, chapter seven, chapter eight is where we introduce these, these Excel functions. We are now in chapter nine. There are no new Excel functions. We're reusing chapter seven and eight. All right, so uh, p-value is an area. These are the two functions in Excel that give you an area. Okay, so now once, let me zoom out a little bit here. Now that you've got your test statistic and your p-value, now we're at the end of the test. Determine what to do with your null hypothesis, right? This is where we are. Determine whether to reject H0, the null hypothesis, or fail to reject H0, right? And this comes down to, is the data strong enough? And then we just converted the data to a z-score or t-value. So there's two ways of looking at this. Now, this is two separate methods. You don't ever have to do both. You know, in real life, if it's a problem in a stats course, you may be asked to do both. But in reality, in in practice, no one does both methods. It's it's one or the other. So you've got the traditional method, which is up here, that will give you a final answer. Right? Then you've got. Uh, let's go with ooh, that's a nice light purple. Then you've got the p-value method. That is a completely separate method. It will also give you this, the correct answer. They both always give you the same answer, right? It doesn't matter which one you use, traditional or p-value, you're gonna get the same answer. Now, the traditional method is z-score versus z-score. Right, you got two z scores, or for proportion. If it's a mean, it might be t value versus t value. Uh, either way, we're not using area. The, the traditional method, we're not using area. We're using numbers. Right, so you got two z scores. You've got the critical value, and you've got the test statistic. You've done both of those previously. Yeah. Test statistic. All right? Z score versus Z score. Something's wrong with my pen here. Test statistic. All right? So the traditional method, the Z score that's further from zero wins. All right? So let me it's maybe a little hard to read with the with the highlighting. With the traditional method, this one here. If the test statistic is further from zero, you reject the null hypothesis. If the critical value is further from zero, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. That's what that means is if the test statistic is further from zero, Your data is strong, right? Data strong. 
uh, if the critical value is the one that's further from zero, your data is weak. All right, strong data, reject the null hypothesis. The test statistic comes from your sample data. So if the test statistic is bigger, either more positive or more negative, that's why I say further from zero. It could be, they could be negative, they could be positive. If the test statistic's further from zero, the data is strong. If the critical value is further, data is not so strong. Right? And alternatively, you could look at area versus area. Right. One of the areas is the significance, that's alpha. The other area is the p-value. Right. And the p-value method, if the p-value is smaller than alpha, here the smaller area is, is, wins, right? smaller area wins. If the p-value is less than alpha, data is strong. Reject the null hypothesis. Right? If the p-value is bigger or alpha is less than the p-value, data is weak. All right. Again, strong data means reject the null hypothesis. All right, so you either compare two z-scores or with the mean two, two t-values. That's the tr traditional method. Or you compare two areas. Again, no one out there in the world is doing this and this. They're not doing both. It's, you're just, it's redundant. It's one or the other. Um, because as we've seen so often this semester, if, if you have, you know, with the normal distribution, if you know a z-score, you could find the area. If you know an area, you could find the z-score. So it's like, if you know one, you know the other one. Now, you can't stop here. Whether or not you reject the null hypothesis, that's not your final answer, right? That's your second to last step. Now that you know what to do, either reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis, then you move on to the final step, which is just giving the final answer in words. State the final conclusion. Now, it's another one of these flow charts. And there's two things that you see on this flow chart. The very first step of the problem, the original claim, and the very last step before this one was what to do with the null hypothesis. So beginning and end is what you're looking at here. So does so question number one, does the original claim contain the condition of equality? So that would be an equal sign in the original claim or a less than or equal to sign or a greater than or equal to sign, you would go this way. Or the original claim does not contain equality. So oops, strictly greater than or strictly less than, or not equal to, you would go down here, right? And then the second question is, what did you do with the null hypothesis? Did you reject it, yes or no, right? So if the original claim contains an equal sign, you go here. If you didn't reject the null hypothesis, you go down here, and this would be your final answer. So you just gotta follow the flow chart. Again, 
this is given to you. It's on my Excel worksheets that are posted on my open math, posted on my website. For those of you watching this video who are not in my class or maybe didn't come to the class, uh, I'll put a, a, a link in the description, I guess, to uh, send you to my website where you could download all these worksheets and Excel files and whatnot. Um, but your final answer should be right here. This is the end of the problem. One of those four boxes, right? You've got the data contradicts the original claim. You've got the data supports the original claim. And then you've got these other two. There is not sufficient evidence to reject the claim. There's not sufficient evidence to support the claim. So that means the test is inconclusive. Right? That happens very often in, in, in practice. All that means is go back, collect more data, right? Maybe your sample size is too small, right? Maybe your sample size is 50, it needs to be 120, or whatever, right? Inconclusive doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It, what it usually means is you just haven't done enough yet. A little bit more data collection, all right? All right, so that does it. In terms of the step-by-step -step process, there's a lot of parts here, but... keep in mind it's a very linear step-by-step -step process right, you start with the claim and once you have the claim sort of everything is is following from the claim the claim is here right the claim tells you the null hypothesis that tells you the alternate hypothesis that tells you uh the the the, the, the graph that you're going to use right tail left tail two tail and so on just like it's a logical progression starting with the claim. Okay, that does it for this video. I hope this was helpful. Uh, it, it, you may be more confused now than when you started watching. This is a, you know, it's a pretty dense topic, especially this is the easiest type of hypothesis testing because it's, it's just using one sample. Uh, but for students, I think it's the hardest type. The, the first, the first time you see hypothesis testing um, is for sure the hardest. After this, you look at hypothesis testing on two samples and, you know, ANOVA. And the stuff that follows, I think, is a little bit easier because you've already done hypothesis testing once. So this is a tough one. This is a, like a milestone uh, in introductory stats. All right. I hope this was helpful. And if you have any questions, please, you know, talk to me in class or, or send me a message.